Hello everyone, this is Maz. If you're hearing this message, it means you're not part of the Voices of War subscriber community and will only hear the first half of the episode. If that's enough, then I'm thrilled. However, if you're looking to dive deeper into the complexities of war, please consider subscribing to our private feed by using the link at the top of the show notes. By doing so, you'll gain access to all of our episodes, the ability to ask follow-up questions, and we'll become part of an exclusive community that makes this show possible. I hope you'll make the decision to join us today. The Donbass does have a unique regional identity and that meant that it perceived itself as different from the rest of Ukraine. In a place where I thought I would be finding victims and recipients of humanitarian aid, I found people mobilizing very creative ways for responding to their situation. Over time, Ukrainians have become more and more aligned behind an idea of a civic identity that transcends ethnicity. There are really two intertwined crises in Ukraine. One of them is the military war. But there's another crisis that we don't hear as much about, which is a relational crisis in which people that were formerly close can no longer speak to each other or associate with each other. The prospects for peace will only come after there's a decisive military victory, because right now each country is staunchly holding to its own position and they're diametrically opposed. There's no overlap. There's no common ground. My guest today is Dr. Greta Erling, who is a lecturer at the University of Michigan and whose scholarship is broadly concerned with international migration and forced displacement. Her major projects have examined the experiences of refugees, asylum seekers, and the internally displaced. Her most recent project explored the subjective experience of the military conflict and forced displacement in Ukraine. Based on ethnographic fieldwork, she documented how the military conflict that started in 2014 reconfigured social worlds and how these social worlds became the site of a different, everyday kind of war. She recently published a book stemming from this research titled Everyday War, the conflict over Donbass, Ukraine. I recently finished this book and found it an exceptionally human portrayal of war as seen through the eyes of ordinary people living in a conflict zone. It describes the everyday struggles, reconfigured relationships, and adjustment to a new normal. But it also talks about the survival of friendships, hope, and humanity. Greta joins me today to discuss her work and to explore what it can teach us about the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine. Greta, thank you very much for joining me on The Voices of War. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here today. So as I alluded to at the start, uh, or before we started recording, I absolutely love this book because I think it spoke uh, a lot uh, to my own experience uh, as firstly a refugee from Bosnia, from Sarajevo, and secondly as somebody who was separated from his father, who couldn't leave. Uh, So there was a lot of uh, aspects of this book. Uh, and adjustments to relationships, interpersonal relationships, to inter-ethnic relationships, uh, a number of dimensions uh, that really spoke to me about this book. So uh, firstly, I want to say thank you for writing it. And I've, I, I found it very insightful and deeply moving uh, and, and very representative of the, in my view, experience uh, of those who've gone through conflict. Uh, so thanks a lot. You know, it's it's great to hear that because I really believe that everyday war isn't isolated to Ukraine. Mm. And and I think that it has uh, broader applicability. And I, you know, I wrote it hoping that it would also have broader appeal. So I'm mm. really happy to hear that. Well, it certainly, it certainly does. And I have no doubt that it would very much appeal to uh, any former Yugoslavs, Bosnians, Croats, Serbs, uh, regardless of whatever, you know, ethnic persuasion they're from, uh, it would certainly speak to them because I think it you really showed the nuance of these types of conflicts uh, where it, it, ethnicity is deeply intertwined with nationality, with identity, with language, and so on, uh, which mm-hmm. are a bunch of things that I really want to get to. Uh, but before we dive into, I guess, uh, the book proper, 
I'm really keen to hear about your own background and how you firstly got into academia, what motivated that move, and then why did you dedicate so much of your professional career to understanding a place like Ukraine uh, and, of course, then the Donbass in particular? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that part of what got me into anthropology was growing up in a very um, ethnically and linguistically diverse community in Madison, Wisconsin. And you might not think of that as a particularly diverse place, but um, my family's house was near the graduate student housing. And so mm. there were literally people from all over the world and they, you know, some, some of them became my close friends. And I think that that experience really, um, paved the way to a career in anthropology because I, I began to feel at home when I was away from home. Mm. I developed a deep curiosity for people who might be a little bit different from me or perhaps very different from me. Mm. And that became a comfort zone for me that served me very well once I was in the situation of, you know, doing field work in a, um, a different country than my own. Mm. Um, you know, I went to graduate school. Um, actually, I should back up and I should say that my first job – after I completed my undergraduate studies was helping refugees find jobs in the United mm, States. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was so wonderful. And I came to learn from their stories what it was really like to be a refugee in the United States. And I think that, um, that experience helped me realize that learning from people's stories is something that I truly value. And I figured out I could translate that into a career um, as an anthropologist. Mm. And I've never really looked back because, you know, I think the beauty of anthropology is that it allows you, it gives you the tools and the resources to step into um, another world, however briefly and to the best of your ability, in order to try to understand it from within. And I think mm. that that is the, uh, it's just, it's a wonderful way to elevate the kinds of stories that otherwise might not be told. Mm. Mm. And I'm guessing your first experiences of trying to find jobs for refugees uh, would have really set you up uh, well for, uh, for that kind of work. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I think that the book Everyday War contains a lot of people's stories mm. because I really wanted to provide an accessible lens for understanding the civilian experience of a country at war. And I think that that makes the book um, accessible to a broad spectrum of people because at one level you just you learn about people and their stories and what mm. they went through mm. and mm. there's another you know academic layer that we can you know we can get into but mm. it can be read at both of those levels mm. Um, mm. so that it's uh, available to a lot of different audiences Absolutely. And the academic layer that you that, that's in there is, uh, is completely accessible as well. It's uh, I, I actually found it really easy to read. And if you wanted to follow up on certain aspects and theories and thinking, uh, there's there's uh, there's room to do room to do that. What is the maybe let's get to the book, The Everyday War. What is the main thesis of the book? Uh, and you've kind of alluded to it already, but I really want to zero in on it. Who did you write it for? Who did you have in mind? When you were writing the book, who did you want mainly to pick up the book and read? Read mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the book explores the subjective experience that civilians have um, in a country at war. And I was motivated to write the book when I realized that conventional stories of war are incomplete. In mm. a place where I thought I would be finding uh, you know, victims and recipients of humanitarian aid, I found people mobilizing very creative ways for responding to their situation. And so mm. what the title refers to everyday war is the conscious and very creative ways that 
civilians, non-combatants, responded to the military conflict. And mm. um, I'm really referring to a very pragmatic, self-defensive stance that's intended to maintain um, a livable world. Mm. Um, and that meant, you know, it, it happened at the level of, of action, whether that was driving to the front to deliver groceries to mm. soldiers you believed probably didn't have enough, uh, to, but there were also the relational elements that you spoke about at the beginning, which is that many people had to terminate personal relationships when they found themselves on opposite political sides. Mm. So the main thing about everyday war is that it's different than war itself because of the uh, objective. So mm. people who engaged in everyday war were uh, motivated to preserve their caring connections. And Alexandra is probably the perfect example because she dropped out of her university studies when she realized that her father didn't have the equipment that he needed for his position as a sniper. Mm. So you may recall from um, those early chapters that she, um, her daily life was organized around drumming up donations so that she could purchase him things like tactical gloves and night vision goggles. Mm. And mm. the reason that that's everyday war is that the, she was fully conscious that the people that he would be in a position to kill as a sniper were her former neighbors and friends. But mm. she placed this very high value on his survival. So mm. in a way, kinship had become tactical, right? Mm. She needed mm. to, to ensure that he survived so that he could be there for her in the future. So mm. everyday wars, the, the, the primary motivation is preserving this livable world, a lived world. Mm. And I guess the way I also took everyday war is that it's, uh, well, as the title suggests, it's it's part of your everyday and it's all encompassing and everything about your life is now deeply tied to that war, uh, whether it's finding means of survival in order to survive, whether it's finding equipment in order to help somebody like your father on the front lines to sustain the fight, uh, whether it's uh, uh, reaching out to foreigners overseas to get aid whether it's, as in, in this conflict, uh, the current war or the invasion, uh, getting onto Twitter to get support, um, you know, mm -hmm. getting marketing messages out there. And again, I can reflect on our own experiences as refugees in Germany, trying to send care packages to dad in Sarajevo, who was a fighting age male and, and couldn't leave, would have been killed at the first checkpoint. We were trying to send care packages through uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent, UN, etc. And, you know, some of these would get through, others wouldn't. Uh, but even things like, because... Things like coffee was currency in besieged Sarajevo. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, small ways that we would try to, I guess, because you weren't allowed to send coffee into care packages. Uh, so small ways that we would contribute to that war would be, you know, we'd get Nesquik uh, or cans of Nesquik, uh, so ch chocolate drink, and we'd slowly peel back the metal uh, bottom of it or cut it out fill the bottom up with coffee and, you know, uh, uh, in vacuum bags and then reseal it, put it back in. And uh, these were kind of these small little victories for me as a as an 11-year-old child. This was a huge victory. I was part of the war effort. So when I was reading about the everyday war, these were the things that I was connecting mm -hmm. with. And again, this is, you know, for a child of, you know, 11, 12, whatever, this was my way of contributing. And reading your book of all the different characters, they were finding different ways and means I guess, to find meaning in this absolute senselessness that is the brutality of war. Yeah. You know, the, the Nesquik, I just have to jump in there about the Nesquik because the, that is such a perfect example because it speaks to the creativity, resourcefulness, resilience that people mm. bring to bear mm. on these terrible situations that they shouldn't have to be in, but they are. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So mm. I love that example. And the celebration when he gets through. I mean, <laughs> it's right. indescribable, right? When dad gets a bag of coffee that was stashed inside <laughs> an Esquik uh, <laughs> by his two sons, you know, and his wife, uh, you know, who, who, you know, gave him this, well, well, ultimately it was a lifeline because not only could they have coffee, but, you know, they could trade 
meat for coffee, which you know is, is just is just incredible. Uh, you opened the book with a really interesting discuss- discussion about the unique nature of identity uh, of the Donbass, and given what's going on right now, and given the fact that the Donbass remains contested as we speak, what is unique about it, and why is this important for us to understand? In fact, it doesn't matter which way you lean, uh, uh, pro-Russia, pro-Ukraine, it becomes almost irrelevant when we start to unpack the identity of the Donbass. Uh, so maybe you can, uh, we, maybe we can start with that. That's a really important question. And I think that, you know, the, the Donbass does have a unique regional identity and that meant that, um, it perceived itself as different from the rest of Ukraine. And that's important because the stories that you tell about your region shape who you vote for, the choices that you make, uh, how you go about your daily life, how you perceive people in other parts of the country. Mm-hmm. And in the case of Donbass, it was um, really a hub for mining and metallurgy in the core. And then there was a sort of agricultural regions, um, farming um, that surrounded it. Um, and that meant that, you know, because of that mining and metallurgy, that meant that livelihoods in Donbass were much more connected to uh, the economy of Russia than they were to the economy of Ukraine. And so when um, we could go back to the 2013-2014 revolution, and people hit the streets protesting the much-awaited um, association agreement with the European Union. And when it didn't go through, a lot of people uh, protested because they were in favor of that European direction for the country. But as you can imagine, that all appeared very different from Donbass. Mm. That sounded like an existential threat to them because – if they went for European Union, that would mean everything from rebuilding the railroads to European specification, to revising their mining and metallurgy standards, to, you know, different systems of measurement. It was comprehensive. And so mm-hmm. they saw their lives and their livelihood more with more, many of them did more with Russia than, than mm-hmm. Ukraine. So that was part of it. But um, as you allude to in the beginning, of course, it's always more complex than that. We can't mm. boil it down to like a single cause. Mm. There were other mm. factors like, um, you know, within Donbass, people were divided. Some people were in favor of that European direction. Uh, other people were in favor of a Russian direction. But what really tipped the scales was um, external facilitation from the side of Russia for the people who had a separatist um, mentality. And that meant, Mm. you know, infiltrating local structures of governance with uh, cadres loyal to Russia. It meant information war. It meant sending mercenaries uh, to fight. All of those factors meant that the people in Donbass who favored the Russian direction prevailed. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, and and I guess it was easy enough from Russia's end to fan or or, or to increase the fault lines that already existed. Uh, so it's uh, it, it it was a it was a rather easy easy victory to achieve, I guess, in the sense of of undermining uh, any bent towards uh, the European Union. But one thing that I forgot to ask, and I think is really important uh, for context, is to tell us a little bit about your fieldwork and and how long you've spent uh, in Ukraine, because not just in this project, but even before that, uh, you've spent some time uh, in the region. So it escaped me earlier, but I just want to let our audience know how deeply uh, embedded you were in the Ukrainian society. Mm Mm-hmm. I first went to Ukraine in 1995 for my first field work uh, when I was a graduate student in anthropology. And at that time, I lived uninterrupted uh, in Ukraine for about a year and a half. And mm. I was so immersed 
uh, in the culture, that I started dreaming in the language, mm. writing my grocery list in the language. <laughs> and this was a time, I, you know, I was living in Crimea, and at, the, at that time, that was before they had cell phone towers or cell phones. Mm. And so in order to call my family, I would have to go to the central post office and sign up for a telephone connection mm, mm. and hope to catch somebody at home. So I was very immersed in my situation. And I think that, you know, the field of anthropology has changed quite a bit now that people are more interconnected around the mm. globe. People do that, do their work um, in a lot of different uh, methodological ways. Mm -hmm. But for me at that time, that particular time, it was very helpful to be so immersed that I was, you know, I, I rented an apartment. I, I was just fully, that was my home. Mm -hmm. Um, but for mm -hmm. this particular, uh, book, um, I had a Fulbright research grant that enabled me to do, research over a three-year period. So mm. I did three trips to Ukraine, and I interviewed uh, about 150 people over mm. that time span that contributed to the um, writing and publication of Everyday War, the conflict mm. over Donbass, Ukraine. Mm. Um, and, yeah. and the reason that it was called, that the book has that word conflict in it, was because at the time I was doing my research, that was the official international designation. It's only been since the, the February 2022 full scale invasion that it was officially deemed a war. Right. Okay. That's, that's interesting. It's helpful to think of it in sort of two phases. There's this first phase that starts with the 2014 uh, occupation of Crimea, which emboldens uh, Putin to see if um, they can't also pull the eastern region in addition to mm. that southern region of, of Crimea. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then the so-called conflict phase lasts up until February 2022, when we have this full-scale invasion that really involves all parts of the country of Ukraine. Mm. And that's, I think, an interesting switch as well and i think you highlight that towards the end of the book as well uh as you as you relate your research from 2014 to 2022 i guess uh, and i found it particularly interesting how you talk about how the undeclared war or the conflict that started in 2014 was perceived in unaffected parts uh, of the country vastly differently to how it was perceived uh in the donbass or in the affected parts what was different and what did you learn? What, 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 what differed in those perceptions of the, of the conflict, I guess, at the time? Mm, mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And for context, you know, for my research, um, because part of my research focused on the people that had been internally displaced and because mm. they were dispersed throughout the country, I traveled throughout the country by train, um, every year so that I could visit different regions within Ukraine and try to get as um, broad a spectrum of perspectives as possible. Mm. And that's how I discovered that views really did vary quite a bit from one region to the next. And when I first began my research, I found that people in the western part of the country did not want their region to be drawn into the fighting that they knew was going on in the East. Mm -hmm. And many of them failed to see the utility of why their sons and daughters should fight to g regain territory that, as far as they were told by Russian state media, at least, had voted to, uh, you know, become more aligned with, with Russia. So they felt that, well, you know, the eastern parts of the country apparently voted for mm. greater unification with Russia. Why should we sacrifice our sons and daughters? And mm. of course, there's also the element of time. With each passing year, um, Ukrainians became more and more 
anxious to simply return to life as normal, right? Mm. There's something that's so exhausting and depleting about living in a country at war. And so one, I think one of the coping mechanisms was to focus on their daily life and proceed as if mm. it wasn't going on. And of course, those sentiments have changed dramatically since mm. the Russian invasion in 2022, mm, mm. which posed such an existential threat against the whole country of Ukraine that, you know, ironically, the, the Russian ag aggression against Ukraine that was intended to split the country apart and fragment it and decimate it uh, actually unified it because mm. Once Ukrainians perceived uh, the, the the real nature of the threat, the scope of it, um, they became much more unified politically, and they also, you know, we were we were speaking a few minutes ago about that um, regional identity in Donbas. Well, over time, Ukrainians have become more and more aligned behind an idea of a civic identity mm -hmm. that like transcends ethnicity. It's this idea that what unites us as Ukrainians is our values that we place on freedom and democracy. Mm -hmm. And irregardless of whether your ethnic heritage is Russian, Ukrainian, Crimean Tatar, or something else – you're Ukrainian if you identify as Ukrainian and if you embrace these values that we as a nation are embracing and trying to realize um, in the Ukrainian government-controlled parts of the, mm. the country. Mm. And I guess we see that now also extended to foreigners who've taken up arms on behalf of Ukraine. Uh, there's this kind of um, uh, embracing in line with certain values – uh, as opposed to nationality, ethnicity, language. And you see it also, Slava Ukraini, you see this everywhere of people from all walks of life across the world uh, who are in some way extending and and sharing their support for what Ukraine, I guess, stands for right now, which again is another way of turning this into an everyday war because it's through through the social media, through the likes of Twitter, that people are participating, maybe not directly in hostilities, but certainly participating in sharing their opinion, their views, or sharing prominent uh, uh, thought leaders on the war in Ukraine. But also, uh, uh, one example that, that just falls into onto my onto my mind as well is uh, I interviewed uh, John Spencer, who's a urban warfare specialist from the US, who came up with a, a a pamphlet. Effectively, you know, I think it started with something like twenty one tweets uh, that was then collated as uh, a urban uh, urban warfighters uh, manual uh, that then became the go to manual uh, across Ukraine. You know he actively joined in many ways the the war, although he did it from the US uh, via Twitter, uh, which again I find is a really interesting way of how it becomes everyday war for not just the people who are now in the conflict area, but those who perceive themselves as being part of the conflict, uh, which mm -hmm. is a really interesting dynamic. Uh, that yeah. I guess we, we, we're seeing unfold right now uh, with Ukraine. I'm familiar with his work. Mm, okay. And and I'm glad that you brought it up because one of the things that's interesting about it um, is just how specific he is, right? The That manual on urban warfare is very street level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's instructions. Like street for, level. Yeah, yeah, street level for the yeah. uninitiated – non non military background a lay person i guess which is right just, yeah, yeah which again contributes to that everyday war right right and i think my book is you know my book is also at that everyday subjective what do you need to do next level mm, but mm. it focuses so much more on relationships and emotions mm. because mm, what mm. i found was that in the literature on war and conflict, 
relationships tend to be treated as like a tangent or a backdrop to mm. the real action. But, mm. you know, I was telling you the story of Alexandra. And mm. if we think about that, we realize that her activities were crucial to her father's survival. And mm. there's so many other examples, you know, when, when, when kinship becomes tactical like that, mm. that it, it really does have uh, an outcome for the people concerned. Mm. No, absolutely, and I, and I, that's that's absolutely the part I loved, and and I've highlighted a quote. Even it's a small one, but uh, in, in, I think it's opening of the chapter three, uh, where you write that the war in Ukraine has reconfigured relationships among people who knew, or at least they thought they knew, one another. What, what did you mean by this reconfigured relationships amongst people who knew, or at least thought they knew, one another? You know, I was really. Um the the majority of people that i spoke with the majority so it was like 67% of the people that i spoke with told me that they were mourning the loss of relationships mm. so it was one of those topics that uh came up time and again and as an anthropologist i like to work very inductively which is to say starting with the concerns of the mm-hmm. people that you're talking with instead of coming in with some sort of hypothesis that you want to test. Mm-hmm. So as a qualitative researcher, I was very concerned to start where people were at that time. And they told me unequivocally that the um, then dubbed a conflict was profoundly affecting their relationships I think Larissa's story encapsulates these dynamics very well because um, she uh, lost her only son to the fighting in eastern Ukraine. He enlisted at the age of 17 to defend Ukraine, and that would have been painful enough, her only son, except it was made more painful by the fact that her sister worked for the Russian installed administration and her mother had contributed funds that helped enable that Russian backed administration to come to power. Mm-hmm. And so she blamed them in part for his death. So I think that that's a really good example because she realized that Although she still loved her mother and her sister, she could not speak to them. She could not associate with them. It was just too painful. And she came to Mm -hmm. increasingly identify with uh, Ukraine as her nationality, Ukrainian as her language, and began to find that there were certain things that she couldn't even express in Russian. She was so... Mm -hmm. Mm, moved to align herself fully with Ukraine as a result of that experience. Mm. But I found sort of two strategies, right? So there was one strategy in which people uh, ended relationships in which they were, when they found themselves to be on opposite political sides, that was one strategy. That was Larissa's strategy. Another strategy was simply to not speak about the topics that were contentious or difficult Mm. as a Mm. conflict calming mechanism. And that enables you to keep the relationship viable, but it's also a loss because it comes at the expense of having the freedom to speak of some of the things that are most meaningful to you. Yeah. Yeah, especially with your, well, with your mother and your sister about the loss of your son, that you cannot speak about that would just be a, a second death almost. Uh, it's, a, a, you know, b- b- Mm -hmm. almost a second death of the son, right? So not only has he been killed, but I can't even mourn him uh, and and therefore cherish his memory with my closest. Uh, So in a way, he kind of, you know, 
Yeah. It, yeah. You just and never get to close that wound in any way. Well, not that it ever would, uh, but it, you can't, you can't balm, put any balm on that wound through those who you most uh, want to share those emotions with. Exactly. And, you know, I keep thinking about there's this cliche that war is hell. Mm. And I feel like the book adds a layer of meaning. Yeah. Because it's the kind of hell in which you can't call your parents because they're mm. on the opposite political side. It's a, it's a different, it's a relational hell. Mm. And that's why I think it's important to realize that, um, there are really two intertwined crises in Ukraine. Mm. One of them is the military war that's being carried out as we speak. So there's the, the, the military crisis um, with the loss of life, the loss of infrastructure, and everything that entails. But there's another crisis that we don't hear as much about, which is a relational crisis mm -hmm. in which people that were formerly close can no longer speak to each other or associate with each other. And I think this is important to thinking about the conflict as a whole, because it's much more straightforward to rebuild the physical infrastructure, whether that's a power plant or an apartment building, than the interpersonal mm. infrastructure, mm. which is so much more difficult mm. to rebuild and will take so much longer than the, the physical parts of it. And I don't say that to minimize the utter destruction, which is, you know, unprecedented mm -hmm. since um, World War II in Europe. I don't mean to minimize that. I'm just trying to say that, and there's another layer that we also need to keep in mind uh, as we think about Ukraine. Mm. And that layer is so structural. It's, it's, it's unseen, but it's structural in the sense that it, it's re self reinforcing and it's then passed on to your neighborhood, to your children. It's passed on to the generation. And again, it's something we saw in Bosnia. Uh, and, and I'm just going to digress just to mm -hmm. give you a small example of, of what I'm talking about. Some time ago, my partner and I, we went to Bosnia. Uh, uh, this was in 2013, and we opened the country's first CrossFit gym. Don't hold that against me, audience, or uh, or you, Greta. You know, we, we left the cult, <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. But but we opened it as a not-for-profit uh, to try and bridge the divide between the different ethnic groups in Bosnia, in Sarajevo that existed, uh, between the local ethnic groups, but also with foreigners, because CrossFit had become something rather big globally, uh, and it's built, a, it has the really incredible potential to build a community. Uh, and we use that to bring something different and new to Sarajevo, uh, and we opened in the old Olympic Stadium. Uh, it was really powerful in that kind of s symbolic sense, uh, but perhaps the most powerful symbol of our two and a half years while you know establishing it and opening it and running it uh, we uh, we did a whole bunch of different charity work for kids with cancer autism etc uh, but we also did a blood drive for the local blood bank and by that stage we had we had coaches who identified as bosniak muslim as a serb orthodox uh, as croat uh, myself as an other uh, as in non-religious, my partner who's Turkish background. Uh, so we're rather mixed. But perhaps the powerful, most powerful symbol was having coaches of different ethnicities sit next to each other giving blood. And of course, the visual effect of all bleeding red. Uh, and I think uh, this speaks to that, I think that point <laughs> of the everyday peace, and, I, and this is where I want to kind of pivot to, uh, but how people will, I guess, in a way, try to resist or reject the dominant narratives that try to divide them, but trying to find ever so slightly glimmers of hope in reconnection. Uh, and that connection, the human connection, is so it, 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 it is absolutely pivotal and critical and key to one's own, well, firstly, mental well-being, but also in, I guess, instilling some sense of hope that maybe, just maybe, just maybe, tomorrow or the next day or the next day, we might be together again, uh, which mm -hmm. is a really um, 
for nations that are divided internally. So this is not, you know, they're sharing the same border. These are the same people in many ways. And all of a sudden they've been forced apart in many ways. This is, I think, what you're, what you're saying is this kind of trauma. This is the, the other war that we don't talk about. We don't, this, this is not the tanks. This is not the mortars, the artillery, the mechanical, technical, tactical war, but it's the deeply interpersonal, deeply, uh, soul destroying. Um, I just wanted to use that as an example because that was one example that where I've witnessed the power of symbols and symbology and how, you know, it went viral as viral could have gone in Bosnia in 2014. Um, wow. this one particular image, uh, because it was so, it just said, mm-hmm. it just said so much, uh, where mm-hmm. you had, you know, two di- coaches of different ethnicities bleeding red. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, um, yeah, I just wanted to share that example with you. Uh, uh, oh, it's wonderful. Uh, it's such a great example. And, and perhaps this is a good time to now pivot to this idea of the everyday peace, which I really, really loved about the book. I, I hope, I, I get the sense it's really coming across the, how deeply engrossed I was in this book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but I really want to touch on some of these uh, aspects of everyday peace. Firstly, maybe I'll let you define what you mean by everyday peace, despite how much we've already kind of talked about it. Uh, but I just want to give you the space to, to, to explain it through your, uh, through your words. Uh, and then I would like to touch on some of the examples of interpersonal peace that you have encountered that you mentioned in the book, uh, because I think they're, again, really, really powerful of the kind of everyday aspect of war. Yeah, happy to define it. Everyday peace is a concept that arose within peace and conflict studies to carefully consider the significance of like non-elite types of actors. So not heads of states or diplomats or the military, but so-called ordinary people. And in the field of peace and conflict studies, they're really interested in um, considering how peace is enacted on multiple levels simultaneously. So, you know, at the same time that um, leaders might be sitting down to the table to carry out diplomatic negotiations, it's very important what's going on Mm. at a local ground level. In fact, uh, according to some ways of thinking, it's crucial to the sustainability of the peace agreements that do get signed, whether or not people in general are behind them and can sustain them. Mm. So this theory came about and If you'd like to hear the rest of this episode and gain access to all of the episodes of The Voices of War, simply become a subscriber using the link in the show notes. As you know, I will not feature any ads on the show, which is made possible solely through the support of our subscribers. If you find value in the content, you can become one now.